Hello, and you're very welcome to the first of our Changemakers Conversations, reflecting back on the past and how people lived then, so that perhaps we can learn about sustainable development into the future and how this may be helping our planet. Today, we're going to talk to Anne Donovan, and Anne was born and reared in Mallon Head in County Donegal. She's going to be talking about her life there and what she remembers about the life of the people who came before her. Right, well, I was brought up on the coast. We were very close to the water. And uh, my uh, grandfather had a farm and did some fishing. So uh, a lot of our food came from those sources. Uh, well, we, we did grow our own vegetables, say potatoes, carrots, onions, cabbage, that kind of thing but anything else and uh, milk and chicken, and eggs, that sort of thing came from the farm. As I say, my grandfather fished as well, uh, as did a lot of local men, so fresh fish was easily available. And uh, we had um, what we called shillock and glassen, which is really pollock and coal fish were the main ones. We had herring and mackerel, all the usual. But uh, we had a lot of extra seafood as well. Um, some of the local men knew the crab holes along the coast, and uh, that was kind of a skilled operation. They, they would go along the coast at low tide with a thing called a clique, which was a long pole with a hook on the end of it. And this was put into each crab hole, and if the crab was in residence, it would latch on to the hook and they would pull it out. Just go back then to talk about the fish. I mean, it was obviously fresh fish, but was there any way of preserving any of these fish like for, for other times during the year? Was that done? Yeah, fish was salted and dried, uh, I suppose it was called stock fish. Um, so yeah, so if, if there was surplus, um, the fish would be salted first with coarse salt. They would be laid in like a, a tin bath or something in layers with layers of coarse salt. And uh, eventually the, this would draw moisture out as well as, as preserving them. So then there would be, um, the fish would be hung on lines to dry. Uh, sometimes inside, I suppose the weather wasn't always that good to be able to leave them out. And then when they were being used, uh, you'd have to soak these dried fish to get the salt out and it might be boiled a few times and uh, they're a different color to the kind of reduced in, in depth and they took on this kind of a yellowy color okay. and, yeah. uh, then they were usually served with like a white sauce and onion mm. sauce and potato that kind of thing yeah. the other seafood now we ate uh, dulse we would gather dulse or dillisk and it would be dried outside usually if you could find a sort of a raised clean place that you try to keep the birds from it yeah. and uh, well it was always eaten dried because it was it was more salty it was better flavor than when it was wet and we also had sloak uh, which was uh, kind of like a sea spinach really uh, it, it was boiled and um, drained and fried sometimes with butter mm. and of course carrageen was used as well uh, uh, it was supposed to be very good for any chest conditions mm. so those those were all there and these i suppose like like a lot of things in the sea these were sort of seasonal were they where, when you gathered them or were any of them available all no, the time? The, well but there were better times of the year maybe spring you know when you had sort of fresh growth that, that you know it was better to do that then were more beneficial it was the, the gathering as well of uh, periwinkles uh, which we call wilks whelks which they weren't really but anyway and um, limpets uh, which which weren't really very tasty they were very chewy but they were both uh, made into a soup this uh, which at home was called um well, part and brie sometimes, or just bar barnia brie, I suppose. Yeah, I've heard the word barnia brie, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Barnia, barnia was the limpet, yeah. Right. 
yeah, banyos, the limpet, and it, it, they were often used as bait for fishing. And as I say, weren't very nice to eat. They were very chewy, but they gave flavor to this soup, you know. As children, we, we ate sorrel, common sorrel, which uh, we wouldn't have realized, I suppose, that it was beneficial. It was just sweet, but uh, very high in vitamin C. So a lot of these things had medicinal. Bee stings was another thing that was eaten. I can remember my grand uncle uh, being given this. It was um, a sort of a porridge like um, consistency and it, it was it was the colostrum the first milk of the cow after calving so it was regarded as being very good for you and then there was like nettle soup as well which was a spring time uh, operation because it was supposed to cleanse the blood and the other one then would have been bog bean which was a plant with a lovely flower that grew in water I think now it's a protected species, you're not supposed to pick it, but um, it was uh, boiled and boiled a long time, stewed and strained, and the taste was supposed to be awful, but it was supposed to be very good for the, for the blood. So, um, well, other things we, we uh, used, I suppose, not necessarily medicinal, but um, things like um, using dandelion juice for warts. This is the, the latex, the milk that's in the stems of the dandelion. And uh, they were very good for removing warts. You'd have to apply it sort of every day for maybe a week or that. And we used um, uh, dock leaves for stings, for nettle stings, and they usually grew together anyway, so. Shopping for clothes, was quite seldom uh, and anything that could be mended or remodeled uh, that's what was done a lot of women had um, singer sewing machines so um, I can remember my, my mother talking about um, making two or three pairs of short trousers for my brother out of a pair of my father's long trousers and of course uh, children <laughs> all wore short trousers boys did um, until maybe uh, they were leaving school. So um, that was done in mending of things, uh, patches and clothes and socks darned and that kind of thing it was always done. And a lot of knitting, um, jumpers, cardigans, that sort of thing. And there was a lot of kind of craft work involved in the two because they, you know, they, they like to try out the different patterns that be Aaron and Fair Isle and all these things that were fashionable. So I suppose that the, and these were things that either they learned from from mothers or or from school um, how to do all this. Yeah, yeah, some of it, some of it, all right from school. Um, because I can remember at school um, having sewing class and uh, there was no running water either. So I remember for the sewing class, somebody was sent out to the nearest stream to get a basin of water to wash hands before you would start the, the sewing class. Maybe like every couple of years to get a coat or something that couldn't be provided at home or shoes or something like that. Although I do remember my grandfather mending shoes. Now he 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 had a, a, a last, this how would you describe a last? Uh, this uh, metal, heavy metal, uh, sort of three-pronged uh, device object that uh, that had the shape of a sole of a shoe um, on each of these three prongs. So yeah. you put the shoe on onto this upside down. Yeah. I remember those two. I remember, and I never. I suppose the three prongs were different sizes of shoes. Different or something sizes, like that, yeah. You put the yeah. shoe on, and that would hold it in place. To yeah. Hold it, yeah, and he cut the leather and and nailed yeah. it on. Yeah, wore hobnail boots uh, to school in the winter. Uh, we had we had ones that were always known in Malinhead as Paddy Harpers. I never quite got the origin of this. Maybe it was a the maker or something, these were ankle boots um, with a little loop at the heel for 
helping you to put them on. Right, uh, flower bags uh, were another thing that were recycled. Um, people, again, because of not shopping too often, people bought large sacks of flour for baking. And this usually had the brand name of the, of the mill on it. So if you wanted to use this as, as a, a material, then the first thing you want to do was get rid of the writing on it. So they would have been washed and at home they would have been um, put down on the beach stones, um, stone at each corner and left there maybe for weeks until they bleached. This was also done with, with the bed sheets, which would have been usually white cotton pillowcases. So uh, <clears throat> anything that you wanted to keep very white, you put it down on the beach. Or sometimes it'd be outside on wind bushes was another thing, but if you, if you were near the shore, the beach was the thing. The, the, these um, then could be sewn like in maybe vests, t-shirts made or aprons. And I, I can remember a particular fashion at home of making pillowcases out of them. Mm. And going to mass or something, it would be bicycles, bicycles everywhere, bicycles to dances and all that. And uh, as a child, then if you might get a lift home, uh, you know, the, the, the man's bike had the bar on it, so you could sit on the bar, maybe on the carrier bike. And uh, tractors would have been used too, to to go to mass. And um, so not too, other, not, not too many that, cars. Not oh, too many. not, not, no, no. Um, then there would be an, an odd bit of taxiing done, I suppose. The odd person who had a car might, you know, bring people to mass, that kind of thing. I suppose like with, with so little moving out and with so much dependence on people, there was a great sense of community around and helping each other and oh, there was. To each other. Oh, there was very much, yeah. I can remember even, um, say, the women helping one another, like wallpapering and this kind of thing was uh, painting. And wallpapering was a thing that there was always three or four local women then helping to do this. Right. Or I suppose, again, then in farm work, you know, the men arrived to help with the baling of the hay or that sort of thing, yeah. And... Uh, you know, uh, the couple of fishing boats that there were as well. Um, you know, the same crews, like everybody mucked in, I suppose, and mm -hmm. helped everybody else, yeah. So yeah. You, you, we, we were mentioning uh, flower bags and, and, and bed clothes and all the rest. So that was a big yeah. task. Wash day was a big task. And, and Wash day. So big how, task. what were your memories or... or well, um, my own memories would be the lack of running water. Uh, you know, we had a tank outside for rainwater that would have been used for that kind of thing. And then we had the well for fresh water for cooking and making tea, that sort of thing. But um, in my mother's time, uh, she remembered um, having to bring the clothes for the whole week to get washed. Now there were nine of them in the family. So uh, this was an expedition from their house to a field they had that went down to the shore some distance away. And there was a stream there. So clothes were all brought. Uh, the, the washing soda, I suppose, was what they used to wash the clothes. And uh, like whatever firewood, food, everything was brought because this was a whole day's expedition. And these, these clothes would have been quite heavy too. I mean, even the clothes that the men wore, like there'd be a lot of woolen stuff, flannel, that sort of thing. And, and bed clothes like blankets, there were no quilts or anything. No, well, not like modern quilts. So these were, were, were very heavy. So they were washed and had to be rinsed and rinsed and rinsed, all this water taken from the stream. And uh, finally then at the end of the day, brought home and put either on the beach or on the line or the wind bush or whatever accommodated the yeah that was some that was yeah. some some That's job right. every probably yeah. every week too or every couple oh of yeah that would be every week because i mean again if you had nine in the family like it 
Mm. It had to be always tough. To be that it. frequent, yeah. yeah. And I think I remember her saying too that an older sister, in her time, um, that kind of it was done more communally. You know, they they lived in a very small village, and I think the clothes for the whole village were were taken. Right. You know, at, at maybe. Put, then in later times, because it was nine in my mother's family, there was probably enough for them to do. But before that, they had sort of everybody helped everybody else to wash all the clothes for the week for the village. Something you mentioned there that might not seem significant to you, but you did say that that uh, the water, you had a water tank at the house. So you yeah. basically harvested water from... Oh, we harvested water, yeah. Yeah, like a very, very, I suppose, yeah. like what, what people are looking at now is, is a very good thing to do, but it, it did mean yeah. it was limited. Oh, it was limited, yeah. And, uh, well, I suppose the fact that we have so much rain maybe, uh, you know, helped. But I do remember times in the summer where it would be kind of getting dangerously low and they'd be hoping for more rain to come, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So again, that's just a reminder that that you know pipe water supplies and all this didn't exist in those days. Oh no, you, know. you had to carry it, and uh, you know it was it was actually handier to carry two heavy buckets than one because you. Sort and would you have remembered carrying water from the well? Oh, I did surely. Yeah. Now the tank was very close to the house, but you you walked a little distance now yeah. uh, for the drinking water. 